This afternoon we have a speaker that I personally have been looking forward to very much to hear during this conference. So I'm keen to listen to him. And I see he's rearing to go as well. <laughs> uh, Mr. Michael Swain is our speaker today, this afternoon. And he's the Executive Director of Freedom of Religion South Africa. Can I just ask, is Pastor Jane Naidu here? If he can come and open for us in prayer. Let's pray together. As Valometus tend us. Father God, we approach your throne of grace and mercy through your Son Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great opportunity to be called your sons today. Thank you for the conference thus far. And right now, even as we come at our times together again to you, we, we know that you are here, you are present. We pray for your son today as you would minister upon the word of the Lord. Whatever will be said and done will bring honor and glory to your wonderful name. Your word teaches us, e that as a year, let him hear what the Spirit will say. So anoint us today as we hear your word. We come at all this today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Jay. So, um, because the program is quite full, I think I'm not going to waste time, um, but we'll straight away ask the Young Men's Choir here from Kwasisabantu Mission to come forward and then render an item in song. Jesus Christ, we had a troublous 
been tempted to say, but never got so far. But today I'm going to say it. My mother used to say this. She said, men are actually gifted with singing. And she said, more gifted than women. But it was my mother, it wasn't me. Hey, I'm not going to 
utige uma wakhe wayeshi ukuthi eh baphiwe kakhulu ngaphezu kwabe sifazane kodwa kushiwo uyena washiwo umama kadokotela because she said you can have a choir of just men and it will be beautiful but women you cannot have a women's only choir ukuthi ke ngoba uma yi abesitisa behlangene becula ayikuphuma impela imbumbulu yento wathi kakaza bezwe abesifazane becula bebodwa well that was a joke <laughs> Our speaker this afternoon is um, Mr. Michael Swain. Is Kulumiga said to Sanam Tanjan Tambama, Ubaba, Michael Swain? I think we have, and we will hear a lot during this conference about faith and acting in faith. Giacolo, what you Nam Tanjan Tambama, Sizosa, Ogningi. Malana no gamba, go go kolwa, no go gwenzizinto, go go kolwa. And often when it comes to policies in government, clash, clashing with Christian principles, Iga kulgazi uma gufiga gwinteto, eshaiwa ngugulumeni, ganingi gwekbe kona ugu shai sana na makristu. Most people often quote Peter and John who said we should be more obedient God to God than to man. But that's not all there is to the battle or the argument between oppressive legislation that oppresses the church and the reaction of the church. I'm always reminded of Paul. When they wanted to whip Paul, Paul said, Is it legal for you? Is it allowed? to whip a Roman citizen. That shows me that Paul was clued up on the law side of things to a certain extent. And then when they wanted to let him go quickly, he said, no, you will walk me out of the city and accompany me. And because they were in a state of panic when they heard that Paul is a Roman citizen. There was a time when liberal legislation just overcame the Christian world. And the church, especially, in, I'm referring to the liberal West. And the church just seemed very helpless about it. That was at the time when Doctors for Life started getting involved in fighting against liberal legislation. And at a time, one of our uh, lawyers made contact with the, at the time, I think it was called the Alliance Defense Fund, 
It's now calling, uh, called Alliance Defending Freedom. It was a Christian organization. And they started Christian Lawyers Association. And they showed examples of the progress of liberal law up to a point where Christian attorneys started getting involved and opposing this legislation. And it was phenomenal, as they mentioned to you, case after case after case, how the church, since when the attorneys, Christian attorneys, got involved, how the church started winning cases. Today, the liberal media even says that the conservative side of society has got, the New York Times said, has got the upper hand. So uh, Mr. from I'm just going to read his CV to you quickly. Uh, just to say that he allowed for a few questions uh, and interaction after he had spoken. If you have a question uh, while he's speaking, if, and you want to, you can even write on a letter, a small piece of paper, fold it close, and just send it to the end of the benches, and we'll try and collect that depending on how uh, many other questions there are. So Michael was raised in England, graduating from the University of Bristol with honors degree in law before immigrating to South Africa in 1983. Michael is a co-founder and former vice president of the Every Nation, formerly the His People Movement of Churches and Ministries. He has spent over 30 years in Christian ministry in South Africa, Europe, and the USA. He has also enjoyed success as a businessman, having founded and run companies in diverse areas including software development, events management, as well as marketing and communications. Michael 
Kanti ke futhi ke ubese benza kakhulu uyasebenza kakhulu futhi nani ukumanager umsebenzi eh wokukhangisa ngamabusinesi noma futhi kwezoxhumana Michael currently serves as the executive director and primary spokesman for Freedom of Religion South Africa or 4SA and he and his wife Lynn live in Cape Town Ubaba ke Michael njengamanje uyena ongumqondisi nongumkhulumeli futhi wenhlangano i4SA eh leli gama ke limele inkululeko yezenkolo emzansi yena ke nonkosikazi wakhe umama ulin base bazinze ekapha So before he comes forward to speak he is asked that we just play a short 2 or 3 minute video to introduce his organization to everybody Freedom of Religion South Africa, known as 4SA, was founded in 2014 after the South African Human Rights Commission wrote to a local Cape Town church and demanded that they cease to teach certain scriptures and to send their pastors for so-called sensitization training. From that time to this, Freedom of Religion South Africa has been involved wherever religious freedom has been under threat, by engaging in court battles, as well as lobbying and making multiple submissions to influence government policy, regulation, and legislation. In many countries around the world today, people and organizations of faith suffer harassment and intimidation, either by government, social groups, or even other individuals, because of their sincerely held beliefs. In South Africa, Section 15 of the Constitution guarantees your right to believe whatever you want and to share and to live out your beliefs openly, whether on social media, at school, on campus or at work. And most importantly, it entitles you to pass on your values to your own children. The Constitution also protects the right of religious organizations like churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and faith-based schools to determine their own doctrine and ethos according to their interpretation of their holy texts and to regulate their internal affairs free from external interference. However, there's a growing global trend to erode and undermine the right of religious freedom and to silence and even sanction people of faith, and it has reached South Africa too. This is not just a simple legal skirmish. It is literally the battle for the soul of our nation. 4SA's mission and mandate is to stand in the gap for faith communities in this nation, helping to ensure that we can all continue to live in a nation where we remain free to celebrate, to speak about, and to live out our faith, beliefs, and opinions, both in private and in public. As a nonprofit organization, we are 100% reliant on voluntary donations to enable us to continue this vital work. Your continued help and support makes sure that the voice and views of the people of faith are heard. And we therefore ask you to partner with 4SA today, because it is only when we join together that we can be effective in the many battles we face in the fight Faith and freedom. So, with that, I would like to hand over to Mr. Michael Sway. Greetings. It is so wonderful to be here. A true honor and a privilege. I first came to Kwasi Sabantu in the year 1990. And I had the privilege of meeting Reverend Stegen. And what I see as I look around is the incredible power of a man with a vision and an amazing supporting team. 
and the power of our God to do abundantly above and beyond anything that anyone could have asked for or expected. Namandla uNkulunkulu wethu asebenzayo abonakala ufuthi ngobukhulu bawo ngaphezu kwesi ngakucela thina. I want to say a special thank you for the tremendous warm hospitality that I've received. Ngithanda ukuba ngidlulise ukubonga okukhulu ngendlela esamukele ngayo nengiphathe ke ngayo ngimfudumale ukulendawo. And it is truly an honor to speak to you this afternoon. You've heard a little bit about 4SA. 4SA is an organization that is dedicated to defending our constitutional right to religious freedom. We look at every draft piece of legislation, every policy, every regulation. We engage with commissions like the Human Rights Commission, the Commission for Gender Equality, the CRL Rights Commission. We look at what is happening in the law courts. Wherever we see religious freedom is potentially under attack. That's where you will find 4SA on the front lines of the fight for faith and freedom. Myself, I am a pastor. I am a committed Christian. I've been in ministry for nearly 35 years. And I believe that God has called me to this role at this season. Because so much of what happens to us in our lives is the consequence of the laws which govern our nation. And if we do not fight the battles in law, if we do not protect and promote and uphold our right to religious freedom, it can very quickly become difficult for us to live out, to express, and to pass our faith on to our children. The right to religious freedom is guaranteed to every single individual by Section 15 of our Constitution. This right came at a very, very high cost. In the European context, warfare took place for nearly 200 years when Protestants and Catholics were fighting each other. It shows us the danger whenever the power of the state begins to use its force to back any faith or ideology, it 
disastrous consequences follow. In South Africa, there is a little town called Franchhook. It means French corner. Does anybody here know Franchhook? Franchhook was founded by people who were called the Huguenots. They were Protestants who lived in France, nearly two million of them. But there was a persecution against them, and by the time that persecution ended, there were literally 10,000 left. And they fled to South Africa, where they found a refuge, where they could express and live out their faith. Religious freedom came at a very high cost. And it is critical that we protect and promote and defend it. Because if we lose it, it will be very, very difficult to gain it back. Some people think, well, am I not free to live out my faith? I think many people thought that until lockdown came. Churches were shut. Religious leaders were not even considered to be essential workers. There was a time when you could go to a casino and pull a slot machine. And that was all okay. But if at the same time, you put your hands together and prayed because maybe you were losing too much money. You could be arrested and put in jail for six months. Because gambling was okay, but religious gatherings were forbidden. And 4SA took the Minister of Cogta to court. And we said, you cannot unfairly discriminate against the faith community. And I'm happy to say that churches were again opened, albeit for a very small number. We suffer sometimes because we do nothing. Some five or six years ago now, there was a report issued by the CRL Rights Commission. The CRL is an institution of the state. And 
And they pointed out that there were many abuses happening in the Christian world in particular. They showed pictures of people eating grass and eating snakes and the prophet of doom. Remember him. And they said, look what's happening in the world of the Christians particularly. We need to regulate religion. We need to appoint Christian leaders and Muslim leaders and Jewish leaders to form committees. And if you want to be a pastor, then you must be evaluated. We must check you out. We will decide whether your doctrine, whether what you are speaking, what you are saying, or what you are doing is acceptable. But here's the problem. Who makes that decision? You know, when Jesus walked on this earth with his 12 disciples, they did not conform to the day of the religious controllers. And if they had been evaluated on what they were teaching, and it was found to be unacceptable, which all the Pharisees and the Sadducees said that it was, they would have been shut down. We cannot allow the government ever to decide what we can or cannot believe. That is not freedom of religion, that is freedom from religion. Yes, it is true that we need to educate ourselves so that we can be better as pastors. But I believe every pastor here will tell me that first and foremost, they are a pastor because they are called of God, not because they have a degree or an education. It took us nearly five years to stop this happening. We were in Parliament for five days on three separate occasions. And 
And we had so many of the faith community backing and supporting us and saying to government, you have no right to regulate or license us without which we're not going to be able to preach. If they had got what they wanted, you would have needed to have a piece of paper, a license, in order to preach. And if you hadn't got that piece of paper, that license, then you would have had to sit down and be quiet. But thank God we prevailed. And today you do not need a license to preach. And I pray that you never need a license to preach. There was an atheist organization by the name of O oh God. They brought a lawsuit against certain schools. And they said they wanted 71 different Christian religious observances banned from the schools. They wanted to make South African schools like American schools, where you cannot open your mouth and speak a word of faith. And 4SA went to court. And we said, no, the South African Constitution says that we are a God-fearing nation. The Constitution allows for religious observances everywhere and in public spaces like schools. The atheists wanted schools with no education and no religion. Again, they wanted freedom from religion, not freedom of religion. I'm happy to tell you that again, we won that case. You can still have religion in schools, praise God. You can still have pastors speaking to school assemblies in the mornings. You can have Christmas carols. You can pray before sports matches. But here's the important thing. The school governing body, they decide the policy for each school. I believe the school governing bodies are the most critical, critical gatekeepers for this generation. 
Yakon would labo about less a goon way petty's goal amongst governing bodies. He born a band of a semcoga, a petto key, Bixas and Alilis. They are the ones with the power to say what can come into a school. He born a band of man, a goon would he go among a fumel bang and a scolin. Or what they keep out. No good, he go among a bang fumel, Gubagung and a scolin. I want to ask by show of hands. Who here is on a school governing body? I want to encourage you. If you're not on a school governing body, when the elections for school governing bodies come around again next year, Make sure that you are on it for the sake of your children and your grandchildren. We cannot go to sleep in this generation. The Bible commended the sons of Issachar because they understood the times. And our times are very, very dangerous for people of faith. And we need to be watchful. When I look at my own country, England, when I was studying law at university, I asked my professors, what is there that protects religious freedom? And they said to me, England is a Christian nation. We have the Magna Carta. Some of the great men of God like Spurgeon and Wilberforce and John Wesley. They were all English. David Livingston, the great missionary, was English. Lord David Livingston, um missionary um cool. Now we come to England. England will always be a Christian nation. But is we like it in England? Ja, lo go ba is we la ma Christ. Wrong you were. Ba be wrong. That photograph. Let's just turn by this. Was taken in the same city where I studied law and where they told me that religious freedom was always going to be there in England. And that man being arrested as a pastor. He was arrested for a breach of the peace. His crime was that he said, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him. And it made some people very angry. And they called the police. And he was arrested. When he was prosecuted, the state attorney said this. In 21st century Britain, if you quote scriptures from the Bible, it is almost certainly hate speech. Icona. 
Icona. Icona. What we are allowed to say is under threat. No question. We have a law in this country. It's called Papuda. It's also known as the Equality Act. Pepuda stands for the promotion of equality. And the Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, Pepuda. In Papuda, there is a clause which prohibits hate speech. And when we hear hate speech, we think, yes, that's okay. We don't like hate speech. But what you have to ask is, what is the definition of hate speech? Our constitution says that we are free to say anything as long as it does not amount to a very narrow definition of hate speech. Hate speech is defined as an advocacy to hatred. That means you whip up hatred. With an incitement to do harm. You're saying to people, I want to make you angry so that you can hurt those people. That's hate speech. Kill the farmer, kill the boer. That's hate speech. Who do we want you to hate? The farmer. What do we want you to do? Kill them. Hate speech, simple example. But what if you widen the definition of harm? What if hate speech is defined as speech that is hurtful, that offends me? What if you can be fined or even sent to jail because something you say hurts somebody else's feelings? How much free speech do you really have? And often we hear that and we tend to think, well, I better not say that because if I do, I may get into trouble. And it can happen. It happened to that young man in the middle. His name is Simeon Chetty. He lives not too near from here, near Chatsworth. He's a young evangelist. And one day he was sharing his testimony about how God raised his little brother back to life from the dead. 
Kono nyusu umfoga cheti lona. Waiga tefaga azugutu nkulunkulu. Wamfu saganja numfoga abo ekfeni. And there were people who didn't like what he said and they opened a case against him for hate speech under the Equality Act. And they tried to open a criminal case against him as well. They wanted him to pay a fine of 300,000 rand. And 4SA defended him. We came as a friend of the court. And we told the court that there had been a very important decision in the constitutional court. And the constitutional court is the highest court in South Africa. And there was a hate speech case called the Kwalani case. And John Kolani was a journalist who wrote an article. And he said some very horrible things about people who are homosexuals. They, in fact, was decided, the court decided they were so bad, they did, in fact, amount to hate speech. But they changed the definition of hate speech that was in the law because it was way too broad. The definition that was in Papuda, the Equality Act, for 21 years, they said that definition of hate speech is unlawful and unconstitutional. And they changed it. And they've given Parliament two years to change it in the law. And so thank God that the definition now means that if you say something that offends somebody, you cannot have to pay a fine, which they were trying to make that young man pay. Praise God. And we thought that was good news. But then there was another bill of parliament came into play called the hate, we call it the hate speech bill. And the problem with the hate speech bill is again the definition of hate speech. The bill proposes to criminalize hate speech. It carries a maximum jail sentence of eight years. And 
eight years just for something that you say. The crime is a definition, is an expression that incites harm. And it promotes or propagates hatred against a group of people specifically listed in the bill. But the problem is, what is the definition of harm? Harm is defined to include emotional harm. What is emotional harm? If I say something that substantially harms you emotionally, I can go to jail for eight years. But who decides what emotional harm is? It sounds very like a fence, doesn't it? And then we have another problem. The problem is the groups of people who are protected. It includes the obvious ones like race. An age and gender. But then it also includes gender identity and sexual orientation. When this bill was first introduced some six years ago, there was no protection for the faith community. You could preach certain scriptures and you could say certain things about certain groups. You could be talking about marriage, you could be talking about even things, by the way, like prostitution. And if somebody was offended, you could potentially go to jail. I'm happy to say that there is now a clause in the hate speech bill that protects religious freedom rights. We met with the Deputy Minister John Jeffrey last week. His department, the Ministry of Justice, is responsible for this bill. The problem with the exemption clause that they drafted is simply this. You're protected for something that you say. If you say it with good intention, you're proselytizing, you're preaching the gospel. Unless what you say amounts to the hate speech definition in the bill. And 
We don't believe that that's an adequate protection. Would you agree? The bill is now going through the first House of Parliament. It's going to go to the National Council of Provinces, the second House of Parliament. Here's the good news. Every time a bill goes through Parliament, we, the people, have the opportunity to make our voices heard. The problem is often people just don't speak up. They stay silent. But let me tell you, when we do speak up, when enough people speak up, our voice gets louder and louder and louder. And there's one thing that politicians listen to. Who's shouting the loudest? Because it's a numbers game. If you pass a law that enough people are really unhappy with, you might not be in government next time election comes around. That is why it is so important that we make our voices heard. Because if we sit and say nothing, then we mustn't be surprised if our freedoms and our lives are potentially taken away from us. I was asked to specifically speak about how we should be speaking as the church. You may have noticed that one of the most contentious areas in society is all about LGBT rights. And I want to say something very clearly. LGBT people are sometimes the most hurting, broken people you will ever meet. And I believe that as the church, our doors should be this wide open to anyone who is a sinner. We should not say horrible things about people. About any person. That is not what Jesus would have done. But we nevertheless still need to speak and preach the truth in love. You may come into a church as a sinner. You may find Christ as your Savior and your Lord. But 
But that doesn't mean to say that the church must now change to accommodate what you want. So we must be careful what we say. We must pick our words. Don't be provocative. Don't be deliberately controversial. We need to be understanding so that we can reach people. Be careful about using stereotypes. I know a pastor who got into trouble with the South African Human Rights Commission. Because he said God did not make them Adam and Steve, he made them Adam and Eve. We need to be careful with our words. But that does not mean to say that we should stop preaching the whole gospel, the undiluted truth of the gospel. God has spoken his word and he will never change it. Stick to the scriptures. If you're part of a church, you should have a statement of faith. So that you can show clearly that you are literally just exercising your freedom of religion right. As I said, it is loving to speak the truth but only if you speak the truth lovingly. A church should be the safest place. It should be us who are standing up for people's dignity. We should never support any form of harm against people just because of their sexuality that we might happen to disagree with ourselves or even say the Bible says differently. And remember that what you say can affect not just you, but even the church that you belong to. It's a good idea to record what you speak in public. And if you do say something that gets you into trouble, then call for a say. And we will come and defend you. Let's have a look at what's happening next. We are facing a battle for the next generation. The next battleground is going to be the young people in our schools. You may have heard of something called CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education. It's taught in schools as part of the Life Skills and Life Orientation CAPS curriculum. There was an attempt to introduce 
teaching on sex and sexuality that was so liberal. So contrary to traditional conservative views and values. An agenda that came from the United Nations. A curriculum was developed. One of the developers was an organization called Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is a multi-billion dollar abortion agency. They make literally billions and they get billions from government for killing babies and even selling baby parts. Why would you trust them to teach your children about sex and sexuality? But when this curriculum was introduced, and government wanted to roll it out, they were given 450 million rand to do so. Because the devil has a lot of money to pay for his agenda. And I'm happy to say that 4SA and others stood up and said no. Government cannot use its power to push an ideology into our public schools. And here we're talking about an ideology, not fact and not truth. But you need to know that last year in October, our government went back to the United Nations. And with the governments of 10 other South Sub-Saharan African nations. And they've given the United Nations Agency the authority to rewrite our curriculum to teach on sex and sexuality. We need to be ready to speak up and to push back. If your children can be taught worldly values and values about sex and sexuality, we are going to lose a whole generation. And it's coming in like a flood. SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Guidelines. I changed my talk today because I received an email yesterday. What I'm about to share with you is literally news that I received yesterday. 
There is something called an early childhood development toolkit. It's designed, as it says, to promote gender equality in early childhood development, a practical guide for teachers and practitioners in South Africa. This is being used to train every preschool, pre-primary, kindergarten teacher in South Africa. It was paid for with a grant of 40 million from VVOB, a Belgian organization, a European organization paid for this. They developed this with the University of Stellenbosch and the Department of Basic Education. It is in its final form and it is being rolled out. They hope to put it into all provinces by the end of 2024. Now you live here. Did you know that this was piloted with 4,000 grade R teachers in KwaZulu-Natal. Did you know that? That's on your doorstep. Did anybody know this was happening? I see one person knew. It's so important that we be awake to these things. We asked the Department of Basic Education, did parents consent to this? And they said, no, we don't need to tell parents about this because we're training the teachers. But who are the teachers going to teach? They're going to teach your little children. And they said, we don't need a public participation process because we're not required to have one for something like this. But it's going to be taught to every little child in this country between the ages of three and seven years old. Isn't that something that we should have a say in? I've written some exact quotes from this manual just to read one or two. It says, this guide supports teachers and practitioners working in early childhood development. To promote gender equality and discrimination based on gender. I've no problem with that. We should never discriminate against somebody on the basis of their sex, if you're a man or you're a woman. We, least of all, should be discriminating against women who often are on the wrong side of discrimination. 
Angmelen no guti sna kwa sabano obli lak bele sna sumuntu ngoba o Wesley sano mu esfasani. But here's the problem. How does this toolkit define gender? So they're training teachers. That saying to teachers, most of us have been raised with the idea that there are two sexes, male and female. The sex is a binary. You can be a man or you can be a woman. That's a biological truth that is recognized across all species of mammals. But they're bringing a new revelation. They say both sex and gender exist across a continuum of possibilities. And they're saying to teachers, you can help young children learn and break free from harmful gender stereotypes and hold them back in that hold them back in life. And one of the things that they want is to have toilets, not for boys and girls anymore. But if you're a boy and you feel like going into the girls' toilet, that's okay, because who knows, you may be a girl. They're telling them to use pictures and stories to talk about gender roles to present gender diversity. They're telling them use activities to get children to question gender roles and stereotypes that promote gender equality. They say growing up, many of us were taught, I was one, that if you were identifying a single person, you, you either said he to a man or she to a woman. It says they was only for groups of people. But now they're saying to teachers, teach children, those rules have changed. Use they because then children will understand that we cannot assume that somebody is a man or a woman just by looking at them. All these things come down to matters of law. For us, A will be challenging this because it is an ideology. We're not saying it's right and we're not saying it's wrong. But we're saying to government, you cannot push an ideology onto children unless their parents agree. So 
Situlumena was a farum teto, no mono arco, Enganeni, Goba, Guinto, Enga Funyan, and Abazalibas, or Lizingan. How many people do not want your child to be taught that? Put your hand up. Banga, the party where Tabanga Funutin Ganeabo, if Fundi Solokus, Paramis is under. Put your hand up. Wave your hand. Now be prepared to use that hand to write when the moment comes. We will be pushing for a public participation process for this. We will be telling government it is unlawful and unconstitutional for you to push this ideology into the public schools. You cannot bypass the school governing bodies. Do you understand now how important it is that you're on school governing bodies? Because you can stop this as a school governing body too. What I'm saying to you is this. We have laws in this country. And we need to be law-abiding people. We need to respect the rule of law. Christians of all people should be law-abiding citizens. But we also have rights. And when our rights are being infringed upon, then it's time for us to stand up and be counted and to make our voices heard. If you agree with me, I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up. It's time we stood up in our generation. Because if, if enough of us stand up and say no, we can stop these threats. We can hold on to our religious freedom. We can continue to preach and teach the truth and love of the gospel. And pass it on to our children. It is our watch. It's our time. For the sake of our children, let's stand. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. I'm willing to take questions on any subject that concerns religious freedom. Um, if I may take the liberty, I would like to pose the first question. Um, before I do that, I just want to say that legislation or law shouldn't just be based on sound uh, public participation. It should also be based on sound science. Um, 
Pagati, no more pillar of band, or a footy if an elegant is shy with the science. And there's a lot of good science actually. We would have had Dr. Cretella from the American Society of Pediatricians speaking at this conference about the science that shows the mistakes in gender dysphoria. And Doctors for Life is standing together with 4SA on this measure. In Nigi, the Kulu Futi, Emilia Yem Teto, Otto, Gote, Labes, and Pilo, Abagabai Challenger, Goba Ibinga Hambisani, Nem Teto, yes, science. Otto, Gote, Lagaben Pilo, Doctors for Life, Yam Sanaga Kulu, Naloku, E4SA, Ebikulumanga. Now, my question goes to the hottest part, as far as I'm concerned, of the presentation. If I preach and I call people to repentance, I would call out people who are stealing to repent from their stealing. I would call out people who are stealing. I will call out adulterers to repent from their adultery and bring it to Christ to receive forgiveness. Now, if I would be speaking on the issue of LGBTQ, and I speak like this, what we find in Romans 1, verse 21, 29. Let's go to verse 25, uh, 24. Therefore, God gave them in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dis the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the cre creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 27. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And I would on this basis call people with an LGBT orientation to repent uh, and that if they don't they are lost. What will I be will I be guilty of or not? That's an excellent question. There was a church in Cape Town. 
they preached a similar message. There's another scripture which says, and some of you once were. And it gives a list of sins. And one of them was homosexuals. And they were reported to the South African Human Rights Commission. And the Gender Equality Commission. And a lawsuit was initiated against them. But here's the good news. You're protected. Because that is a holy text. The problems come when people go off script. When they start to really say horrible, nasty things about people who are of a different sexual orientation. When we preach the gospel of repentance, yes, we will call out people for their sin. And we trust the Holy Spirit will convict them. And that the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. And they will see that there is a better way in Jesus. And that's all protected. But what I said at the beginning, I say again. We must speak the truth in love. And we must trust God with the results. And we must be fearless. We talk about being bulletproof. If you stay within scripture, if you stay within your statement of faith, if you stay within the beliefs of your church or your denomination, you're okay, you're safe. But just because you're bulletproof doesn't mean to say that you're not going to get hit by a bullet. But as I said, if you ever find yourself in that situation, in law you have defense. And we will certainly defend you. Make a petition and sign and send it to the Constitutional Court. I'd love to say that's a great idea. <laughs> but it's not. Law is very specific. It's very much involved with administration and procedure. That's why we must push government to open up for public comment. Because we can say that in law, there are certain things that they have up for public comment, even if they don't want to. 
And when they do, petitions are not the way to go. You can send in one petition with a million signatures. It counts for one submission. But if those same people who signed the petition wrote individually one million submissions, it would be a shout that would be almost impossible to resist. So that's why I believe look at what 4SA is doing. Follow us on our website. Follow us on our Facebook page. Maybe we can have the details back on the screen. Because when the opportunity comes, then we will let you know. And we will help you with what to say. And we will make sure that it goes to the government so that they can register it and hear your voice. And if enough of us speak up, our voices make a difference. So be ready. Since the new bath that the new bathroom laws that might, but the schools. Okay, it says, if my female child does not want to use the bathroom with a boy who claims to be a girl, does my daughter have the right to demand the use of bathrooms with her own kind? That's one of the big battlegrounds. Because it involves rights of personal privacy. And even personal safety. No paper food. So we have to watch these things. And we have to say no to these things. Again, it's a question of raising our voices when the opportunity is given. At the very best, I think there should be a compromise. That for those perhaps who are undecided as to their sex or sexuality or gender, Maybe there should be a genderless bathroom. But these are issues for you to decide. And for the schools to decide. But they are serious issues. Because this gender confusion is causing havoc amongst this new generation. And it leads to horrible consequences. And I'm not denying that there are some people who genuinely suffer from gender dysphoria. And they deserve our sympathy and our compassion and our prayers. 
But the challenge here is that this is becoming increasingly politicized. I think I should also say one more thing. The advice that I'm giving you here is not legal advice. For SA, we understand the law very well. But we ourselves are not lawyers. We're not a legal firm, that is. We have qualified attorneys and qualified advocates. So we can give you a view. But you cannot rely on that view. You always need to go to a lawyer who is a qualified lawyer, who is a registered lawyer, for a second opinion. That's just my disclaimer. <laughs> If I, as a foundation phase teacher, refuse to teach this curriculum, do I have protection under law? I would say, yes, you do. I said at the beginning, the constitutional right to religious freedom guaranteed by section 15 is yours as an individual. You cannot be forced to do something or say something that goes against your conscience and your belief and your faith. And you should register that objection at the earliest opportunity. And if you belong to a union, you should also, I think, speak to your union. And you should lodge an objection with the school governing body or with the parent body. But yes, you do have a right, and that right protects your conscience and your belief and your faith. Um, please explain. <laughs> Is it correctional service, correctional service where Satanism is allowed to operate in the center? In the center. In yes. It's worth making a point. The question is, what about Satanism? Uh, and particularly Satanism in the correctional services. Um, I think it's very important to say one thing about religious freedom. You cannot hide behind religious freedom and commit something which is unlawful or criminal. Can you believe what you want? Yes, you can. Can you believe in Satan? Yes, you can. But can you carry out satanic practices and rituals that potentially harm other people and then say, that's my freedom of religion? I don't believe you can, no.
question, can I refuse to marry a homosexual couple? Okay, can I refuse to marry a homosexual couple? You're all waiting for the answer, am I right? Absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. And let me tell you why. In South Africa, we have just had a process to develop a marriage policy. This was a process that took place over approximately three years. The problem with marriage laws in South Africa was that there was no unified marriage law. There was the Marriage Act, which covered typically traditional heterosexual marriages. There was an Act of Parliament which covered traditional marriages. And then there was a case in the Constitutional Court where a same-sex couple said, well, it's unfair discrimination if we are not allowed to marry. And the Constitutional Court agreed with them, and Parliament passed another act. It was called the Civil Union Act. It gives same-sex couples almost identical rights to heterosexual couples. But in order to be married as a same-sex couple, you had to be married under the Civil Union Act. And the person who married you had to have a special license under the Civil Union Act. And very few pastors applied for licenses. That means that as a pastor, if you have a marriage license today, almost certainly that license has been issued to you under the Marriage Act. And in the Marriage Act, there's a clause which says that you cannot be forced to marry anybody, either as an individual or as an organization that goes against your conscience and your convictions and your beliefs and the tenets of your faith. So you can say no. But then there was a problem. Because when the marriage policy was now being decided, all these different marriage acts were going to be scrapped. And a new single marriage act will come into force. And the big question was, if you as a pastor have a marriage license, should you be forced to solemnize all marriages? And the 
There was a big push to say, yes, you should be able to be forced to because you are representing the state. It is the state who gives you your marriage license as a marriage license officer. And FOSA and others were engaged in that process from the beginning. We spoke on panels, we made submissions. And we said, you cannot force pastors to go in against their conscience and to violate their conscience because that will be a complete negation of their religious freedom right. And we said, why don't you look at marriage like this? There's a legal part of marriage which involves things like property rights and children and what happens to your property after you die. Was it a voluntary relationship? We said those are the things government should be interested in. But then there's the spiritual side as well. And different faiths have different ways of solemnizing their weddings. And the end result was this. The new policy says that pastors will never be forced to solemnize a marriage that goes against their conscience, faith, and belief. And now we're waiting to see what the draft marriage bill is going to look like. Because we are expectant that it will follow the policy and make that in the new law. But we need to be watchful. And if it's anything other than that, we'll let you know. And then we can stand up. Is, is 4SA for all religions or the Christian religion only? I myself am a pastor. I made up my mind a long time ago. But when you talk about law, law is neutral. The right to freedom of religion applies equally to all faiths. So what's good for one is good for all, and what's bad for one is bad for all. Let me tell you quickly about the case of a Hindu girl. She went through a coming of age ceremony, a traditional coming of age ceremony in the Hindu faith. And when she came back to school, she had a little stud through her nose. And the school said, take it off, it's jewelry. And 
And she said, no, it's an expression of my faith. And the Constitutional Court agreed with her. And they said, we have to protect religious freedom. She has to be allowed to express her faith. That's part of faith. Now, if we'd said no, because she's another, another faith, she's not a Christian, she should take it out, do you know what would happen? Somebody sees you wearing a crucifix. And they say, take it off. And you'd have to take it off. Well, they see a girl wearing a promise ring that she's committed to stay sexually pure till she marries. And because she believes that the Bible says that she should stay pure. It's an expression of her faith. But if we say to the Hindu girl, take the ring out, we must say to the Christian girl, take the ring off. Take the crucifix off. See, the law is neutral. And so when we go and we engage, we engage on the basis of law. But this we know. 99 times out of 100, Christianity is the target. And I defend all faiths for one reason and one reason only. So that the gospel can be freely preached proclaimed and taught because, because Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And we must always speak the truth. Thank you. Bazalwane Bafundis in Kulindab Gotom Unkulunkulum Kuluka Kul Seabonga Kakulunga Locus is really. We are so thankful for what we've heard. Now, um, there's just a request. Uh, from Michael Swain that we just uh, remind you again that the 4SA is exclusively, completely dependent on donations. Uh, now, I see he's on his computer. He's got all his banking details. Oh, hang on. There they are. That are their banking details. And after what we've heard, I would like to call upon our, all of us, brethren, come, let us support them. They stand in the gap where we cannot stand. But where we are, we will do our part 
Go and, and to stand for the truth. When we preach, or when, when we have interaction with government officials. So there are the banking de details for everybody. I'm a banking details aboge number ya kuloyo ongatanda. Then I would like to just finally ask that we close in prayer. Can I ask Pastor Hans Koller from Romania to come and close for us in prayer? And then there are keys that have been brought here for those. Herr Jesus, wir danken dir für die verschiedenen Glieder deines Leibes. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the different members of your body. Jedes Glied hat eine spezielle Berufung. And every member has a special calling. Aber wie wunderbar brauchen doch jedes Glied das andere. But how wonderful that each one needs the other member as well. Wir danken dir, was wir heute hören konnten. We thank you, Lord, for what we've heard today. Und wir bitten dich auch für das Abendbrot. And then we pray, Lord, for the meal, the supper that we're going to enjoy. Bitte segne du es uns. Please bless that to us. Wir bitten dich auch für den Abenddienst und für den morgigen Tag. Bitte, Herr Jesus, bleibe du bei uns. And then, Lord, we would like to pray for tonight's service as well. And then also for tomorrow. And we want to say, Lord, please stay with us. Amen. 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 Thank you. Numa. En Numa. El Numalo. Kukonikatilga en mumalo el tolaged en mumalo. Sia bonga, sponga kakulu, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>